بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله أما بعد today inshallah as well as has been publicized going to give a talk about al imam al bukhari al imam al bukhari his kumi was abu abdullah and his name was muhammad ibn ismail ibn ibrahim ibn al al mughira ibn Bardizba Ibn Ju'fi Al-Bukhari Rahimahullah Ta'ala A lot can be said about Imam Al-Bukhari And I don't think we have enough time To do justice to the topic But let me begin by saying that Imam Al-Bukhari is A symbol of Authenticity in our religion When you talk about Sahih and Imam al-Bukhari is a symbol of that, a rams from the rumuz of authenticity. And Imam al-Bukhari is a minhaj. I don't think that there is any personality who is more well known than al Imam al-Bukhari after the companions, Rabdi Allah Anum Ajma'in. Not Ibn Utaymiyyah, not the four Imams of the different madahib. If a person was Hanafi, he knows about Al Imam Abu Hanifa, but he may not know a lot about Al Imam Malik. Whereas all of the people of the Madahib, they all know Al Imam Al Bukhari. An Imam and a symbol of Sahih, a Sihha, a symbol of Minhaj. If the Muslim community really appreciated, and they knew and understood Imam al-Bukhari's legacy, then we will find every single time that the winds of adversity, when they blow our way, we'll be able to deal with them if we were only on the minhaj of Imam al-Bukhari. If we were only on the level of siha, of our hadith, of our religion, the way Imam al-Bukhari was. Recently, we heard here in Birmingham, that there is a university that they showed or they claimed that they had some pages of a Quran, a Mus'haf, from during the time of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Many Muslims sent this out in their text messages and they were happy. I even saw with my own eyes some Muslims in the city center giving dawah to non-Muslims and they were using the fact that this thing was found in the university there in Birmingham, it was a delil for the Muslims that the Quran is the kalam of Allah and Al-Islam is true. The Shiite, the Shiite of Al-Iraq and Iran, three or four years ago, they sent out text messages, emails, in which they said that the Mufti of Saudi Arabia, the Mufti of Saudi Arabia and the Mufti of Tunis, they said that both of them apologized for saying that the Eid was on the day that we celebrated the Eid, the people of the Sunnah. This email text message was sent out again a few days ago. And then when it was sent out, many Muslims, they were in what is known as Hira. They were like, Hira, what, what's going on? Do we have to fast another day? Do we make a mistake? If the Muslims only knew the religion of Al Imam Al Bukhari, the symbol in Al Islam, a man who was not comfortable with blowing any direction that the wind blew him in. He wasn't like that. He was a man of a siha. My kids, I get upset with them if they put a paper or another book on top of the Quran. They don't mean it. But one of them may put a paper or a book on top of the Quran. I say, hey, that's the book of Allah. Don't do that. And I also get upset with them if they put another book on top of Sahil Bukhari. Because I want these kids to know. The book of Al Imam Al Bukhari is not like any other book in the dunya. 
It is the most authentic book on the face of the earth after the Quran of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The man is a man that is a symbol of authenticity, a symbol of minhaj. Allah ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, لِكُلِّنْ جَعَلْنَ مِنْكُمْ شِرْعَةً وَمِنْهَاجًا We gave all of the people who came before you a sharia and we gave them a minhaj, a way of how to do things, a way of existing. Our religion is not taken from people who are unknown in Al-Islam. You know those scholars in Al-Islam, Al-Imam Al-Hassan Al-Basri, Al-Imam Muhammad Ibn Sareen, Zayd Ibn Aslam, Many of the people from the Tabi'een, may Allah have rahmah upon them, they used to say, this religion, this knowledge, knowledge that you learn, this knowledge is your deen. So pay attention who you take your deen from. You revert people, all of you. Pay attention who you take your religion from. So when people send you text messages, emails about this and that and this and that, people make claims you have to be a person who doesn't go along with everything that comes to you. You have to say, where's the authenticity of this? This is Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. So I can come to you people and I can tell you, Al-Bukhari he was born in this year and he died in that year and he did this and he did that. And you may remember uh, and you may But one thing I want you to remember is, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari is a man of minhaj. He's a man of the deen. The way that the Prophet ﷺ brought it. So in his book, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, you won't find any other book in the dunya, in Al-Islam, that has been serviced and taken care of like his book. There are over 53 other books that explain Sahih Bukhari. 53. Just talking about the explanation of the ahadith. That's just the explanation. Not to mention the books that talk about the people who were his sheikhs, his sheikh, who he took from, or the other people who came in the names of in, in the names of the narrators in the many asanid transmissions of Al Al Imam Al Bukhari. So a lot can be said. But I want to place emphasis on this stuff, looking at you especially. You revert people. Al Imam Muhammad ibn Sareen, and other than him, he said, And in another narration, This knowledge that you learn, someone is speaking to you, this knowledge is your religion. Pay attention who you take your religion from. Don't take your religion from a jack leg, ignorant person who doesn't know the religion. Don't take your religion from someone who doesn't know what he's talking about. Don't take your religion from an individual who's going to give you some stories that have no proofs to them, a hadith that are weak and fabricated. Take your religion from the source that the Prophet brought to his companions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa radiyallahu anhum ajma'in. Again, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, his kunya, Abu Abdullahi, the father of Abdullah. So here you have this man who's taking care of the hadith. He has the most authentic book on the face of the earth after the Quran. It's only befitting, it's not wajib, but it's only befitting that he would call his son Abdullah. The Prophet mentions, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inna ahab al-asma'i ilallahi abdullahi wa abdurrahman the most beloved name to allah azawajal is abdullah and abdurrahman because it shows servitude to allah azawajal servitude so he named his son abdullah his name was muhammad his father's name was ismail his grandfather's name was ibrahim his great great his great grandfather's name was al mughira his great great grandfather was birdazba and he was from the place in Bukhara. They were like Chinese looking people. They're not Arabs. And Imam Bukhari, he looked like those people who are in Uzbekistan. 
They look Chinese. They're not Arab. And Imam al-Bukhari was not an Arab. He was a non-Arab, but he rose to the ranks and the level where he surpassed all of the Arabs in the dunya as it relates to the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. And Imam al-Bukhari, akhwani, he was born in the year 194 and he died in the year 256. So he was 62 years old. He was born in the year 194 and he died in the year 256. So he's from our Salaf, from the generation of Muslims who we've been commanded by our Prophet to take our religion from and to pattern our lives after him. A few things that should be mentioned about the youth of Al Imam al Bukhari. Many things can be mentioned. I want to mention three, inshallah. Number one, Al Imam al Bukhari's father, Ismail, is Muhammad ibn Ismail ibn Ibrahim. His father, Ismail, was from the ulama of Al Hadith in the country where he came from in Bukhara. He was a scholar, he was preoccupied with knowledge. He took from some of the major scholars during his time. Two of them are from the Umar al Mu'minin fil Hadith, from the greatest scholars in the Hadith. His father met up with and learned from Al Imam Malik, Al Imam Malik ibn Anas. His father also learned from Al Imam Abdullah ibn al, ibn al Mubarak. These two men, they're called Amir al Mu'minin in Hadith. There are only eight others who had this description. And Bukhari was one of them. So his father, Ismail, learned from the ulama of al-hadith. From them as well as the great scholar, Hamad ibn Zayd. Those three scholars and other than him, the other than them, and the Imam al-Bukhari's father took from them. It goes to show, if the father is busy giving dawah, learning, teaching, studying, Inshallah, hopefully, it'll have an impact on his kids. Hopefully, not always, but hopefully. You leave yourself jahil, far away from books, far away from learning, far away from the Quran, far away from Salah and the Masjid, far away from doing this religion, then how do you expect your kid to come close to that? You marry your daughter to a knucklehead, far away from the dawah, far away from knowledge, far away from the masjid and the Muslims and khair, how do you expect your daughter and her children to be connected to this religion? They say in America, the apple doesn't, far, doesn't fall far from the tree. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. If the father puts himself in a position where his day and his night, his drinking, his eating, his sleeping, his walking is the Quran and the Sunnah, then inshallah it's going to have an effect and an impact on the kid, the barakah. And so Imam al-Bukhari's father, he has something to do with Imam al-Bukhari. He has something to do with that. Another issue is his father died when Imam al-Bukhari was young and he left Imam al-Bukhari with some money. So that goes to show two points I want to mention very quickly. He left Al Imam al Bukhari with some money, with some dough, with some cheddar. In our religion, a sunnah that many brothers don't pay attention to is what the Prophet told his companion, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas was sick and he thought he was going to die, and the Prophet came to him and he visited him. Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas said, Ya Rasulullah, I have this money, I want to give it all in sadaqah. He said, Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't give all of your money and all of your wealth in sadaqah. Give some of that money and leave it for your children. He told Sa'ad ibn Abi Waqqas, لِأَن تَدَعَ وَرَثَتَكَ أَغْنِيَا خَيْرٌ لَكَ مِنَ أَن تَدَعَهُمْ عَالَةٍ يَتَكَفَّفُونَ النَّاسِ For one of you to leave his children in a position where he has some money, he is self-sufficient. He has money from his dad. 
This is better than leaving him in a situation where he's impoverished with no money. We has to go and say, give me some money. Give me some money. Give me some money. So it's the responsibility of every father to try to make a situation where he's making jihad, where he's going to leave his kids something so that they don't be bums asking people for stuff. Many a hadith about this issue. He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wa'alam anna sharaf al-mu'min qiyamuhu fil-layl wa izzuhu istighna'uhu an al-nas. No. That the honor of a believer is that he stands up in the middle of the night, during the night time. That is shara for him. That he stands up to Allah praying. And his izza, the fact that he is aziz, is the fact that he doesn't have to rely on people. So we talk about and we hear the sunnah of the miswak and the sunnah of putting your heels together and the sunnah of saying ameen and the sunnah of doing this and all of that is important pointing your finger in the tashahud but the sunnah of leaving your kid to the best of your ability where he has some wealth if his father checks out he has some wealth where they don't have to put themselves in a situation as another hadith said he goes and he asks people and the person may give him and it may not give him for verily the hand that is upper is better than the hand that is below so when Imam Bukhari's dad left him in that situation and he also left him as an orphan. There are many scholars in Al-Islam who were orphans. And from those scholars is our Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Sayyid of Bani Adam. He was an orphan. From those scholars, Al-Imam Sufyan Al-Thawri. From those scholars, Al-Imam Ahmed, Al-Imam Shafi'i, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, Ibn al jawzi the fact that you have tough circumstances, the fact that someone is an orphan and life is tough, doesn't mean you can't be somebody in the future. You Muslim people, you youngsters, don't let anybody, white, black, Muslim, not Muslim, rich, poor, tell you you can't be what you want to be. You just got to put the work in. You got to get on your grind and put the work in. So when Imam al-Bukhari Rahimullah Ta'ala grew up as an orphan. And the orphan in Islam, the yatim, who was the yatim? He is the person who lost his father when he was young. If he lost his mother, he's not a yatim. The yatim, he lost his father when he's young. The, the presence of the father in Al Islam is important. So even a father who may not be married to his children's mother, he has to leave his children with some money. He has to leave his children with some adab and tartib. He has to be a part of the picture. And Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala grew up as a yatim. And it didn't stop him from reaching the pinnacle of what we're bringing to your attention right now. The third and last thing that we want to mention about Imam al-Bukhari's youth is he was born with the ability to see. But Allah Azzawajal took his eyesight from him when he was young. And he was blind for a period of time. And again, there are many people, many scholars of Islam who are blind, past and present. From them were the companions of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The best of the people, they were blind. The companions of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Like the companion Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, Abasa wa Tawalla and Ja'ahu al-A'ma, the Mu'adhin. He was blind, couldn't see. Hassan ibn Thabit, the one who was the poet of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was blind. Sa'd ibn Abi Waqaz, Al-Abbas became blind. Abdullah ibn Abbas became blind. Ka'b ibn Malik became blind. Not to mention many ulama who came after them. So the fact that a person may have some type of so-called handicap or impairment, again, it's not an excuse for a person to give up on life. To say, okay, I have one leg shorter than the other leg. Okay, I have one liver, I don't have the other liver. One kidney, I don't have the other kidney. I have one eye, I don't have the other eye. That's not an indication that you have to be fashil, that khalas, you're done. Especially, especially, the person is this color, not that color. 
we can't accept, can't embrace Ahi Zakaria, any of you young brothers, because you are black, you're from Africa, you're Pakistani, you're Asian, you're Arab. Don't let anybody make you feel you a second class citizen because of your color. What about the person? The person, he's blind, he can't see. Given a choice, do you want to be blind or would you like to be this color? Everybody's going to say, make me this color because being blind is a problem. El Imam al Bukhari and those other ulama before him, they were blind. But it didn't stop them from, again, reaching the pinnacle of success as it relates to here, 2015, we're talking to you about their legacy. How many people were not blind during the time of Al Imam al Bukhari? We don't even know their names. How many people were, how many people had their mother and fathers during the time of Al Imam al Bukhari? We don't even know their names. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we know his name. And he was your team. And he's the greatest known to mankind. Salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayhi. Al Imam al Bukhari, Akhwani, memorized the Quran at the age of 10. By the time he hit 10 years old, he was half of the Quran. And this is what was the norm during their time. <laughs> you hit the age of 10, you have the book of Allah in your head. After hitting the age of 10, at the age of 11, 11, he started learning from the people around him, where he came from, in Bukhara. He started going to the masjid, learning Arabic, learning this, learning that. When he hit the age of 16, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari went to perform Hajj with his mother and his brother. When they performed Al-Hajj after the completion of the monastic of Al-Hajj, he told his mother, I'm staying here. I'm staying in Mecca. I'm going to stay in Mecca and Medina and I'm going to get knowledge. And the mother didn't have any problem with that. She returned back to Bukhara with her son, Al-Imam Al-Bukhari's brother. In Mecca, in Al-Medina, he met the leading ulama of that time. In Mecca, from them was the tremendous imam who has a name similar to one of the companions. His name is Abdullah ibn Zubair, rahimahullah ta'ala. Abdullah ibn Zubair. Companions of the Prophet Sallam, there was an Abdullah ibn Zubair. His father Zubair, one of the ten people promised Jannah. Put him on the side. And Imam Bukhari in Mecca, one of the many ulama that he met, Abdullah ibn Zubair. The very first hadith in Sahih Bukhari is the hadith, إِنَّمَا الْأَعْمَالُ بِالنِّيَاتِ وَإِنَّمَا لِكُلِّ مْرِئٍ مَنْ نَوَى That's the first hadith he puts in his book. And his sheikh who gave him that hadith, Abdullah ibn Zubair, rahimahullah ta'ala. And Imam al-Bukhari, akhwani, remained in Mecca and Medina at the age of 16. The age of 16. He remained there for a number of years, getting knowledge. Can you imagine those of you who are fathers? I remember I was 10 years old, like my son is 10. I remember I was 10. I used to go to school with other youngsters in the neighborhood. And we were walking across about six or seven streets before we got to our school. I would never send my son to school crossing six or seven streets because he's 10 years old. I would never do it because our time is different right now. I remember when I was 10, we used to go on top of the buildings, the buildings. We used to go on top of the buildings and we would jump from one building to the next building, daring the next kid. We dare you to go. If you slip, you're done. Stick a fork in them. You're done. You're going to fall down and break back. I can't imagine leaving my kids to go out and play. They said to me, hey, Abby, you want to go to the local park? I say, no way, Jose. You're not going to that park. I'll take him to the park and I'll come back and pick him up. 16 years old. And Imam Bukhari stayed in Mecca, Medina, going back and forth. And that's when he began the formidable years of establishing himself in knowledge. And Imam Bukhari, Akhwani, he had about 1,000 teachers, shayukh. 
Now you read, because Muslims love, we don't have a minhaj when it comes to history. The scholars, they showed us a minhaj in history. You know, like this book from the, from, from the Quran. The non-Muslims, when they find something that's old, it came from the time of the Prophet wasallam. For an example, this Quran that they have really came from the time of the Nabi wasallam. The kuffar, they jump up and down. They jump up and down because it's really old. The Muslim is not like that. Maybe it came from the time of the Nabi wasallam. But what we want to know is, is it compatible to our Quran, to this Mus'haf? What we want to know is, who wrote it down? What we want to know is, when he wrote it down, did he compare it to other things? We have a minhaj. Al-minhaj al-ilmi. Muslim is not the guy who just jumps up and down and says, oh, oh, no, no mushaf pages from the time of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're going to ask the question, how did he get in Birmingham? And why didn't we know about it last year? Why did it just come out right now and pop its head up after the prime minister gave his speech? We're going to ask questions. We have to have a minhaj ikhwani about everything. So sometimes you read about an Imam al-Bukhari and you read books where it said he had 80,000 scholars. Does anyone here know 80,000 people? Does anyone here know 80,000 people? It's very difficult to conceive that a person knew 80,000 people. 80,000. So we don't have to go overboard. This doesn't make us feel good or bad, is it? What are you talking about 80,000? When you look at the kalam of the muhaddithin, the people of knowledge and hadith, they said that Imam al-Bukhari had about a thousand teachers. And that's a lot. A thousand teachers is a lot. He had about nine to ten thousand students, obviously. Because he's going to be giving classes and many people are going to come to him. But 80,000 so if someone wants to talk about El Imam Bukhari's virtues and he sends a text message saying he had 80,000 students. Hey, this kalam, it doesn't make sense. In the email or the text message that I received, it said that the Mufti of Saudi Arabia, the Mufti of Saudi Arabia, he apologized and he said he made a mistake and he said that the Eid should have been on Tuesday. It should have been on Tuesday. But he made a mistake. And he said it was on Monday. And that the Saudi Arabian government is going to pay a fidya for every single person from their country. When a person reads, like, reads something like that, he has to say, how, how can the aid, he said he made him a six on Tuesday and our aid is on Friday. If anything, I would see if it said it, it was on Saturday, it should have been on Thursday. But it said Tuesday. And the people get upset. Say, oh, those Saudi Arabians, those guys. And who in his right mind would think that Saudi Arabian government is going to pay a fidya for every single muwatan, for every single citizen? Ikhwani, we have to be people who sit and we have to use our brains in the right place. And the way we do that is, Ahi. The way we do that, Nur al-Din, Adawi, the way we do that, you got to have a minhaj. Don't let people come and tell you anything. Uh, we have a sheikh here, and I have to say this. A sheikh Adnan Abdul Qadir, Hafidhullah. He's going to be giving a talk here tomorrow, inshallah, about the tremendous book, Kitab al-Tawheed. And now at this time, the text messages will go around. The major scholars in Saudi Arabia, they said, about him, don't go and don't listen to him. That was never said. The major scholars of Saudi Arabia, they criticized a book that he wrote called Haqiqatul Iman, The Reality of Al-Iman. They had some differences with him in that book and they accused him of a few things. My question is, did you check it? Do you have any idea of what's going on? then don't listen to the people who are jumping up and down telling you this and telling you that. It's confusion. 
and the major scholars in Saudi Arabia, they are not, they are not, with all due respect, they are not the final say so when it comes to halal and haram and this religion. Now, some people, when they hear me say that, they get upset and they jump up and down. Get upset. Abu Sam is against the Hayat Kibar Ulema, La Wallahi. The same people who will say that about me, they're the ones who will say that members of this Hayat Al Kibar Ulema, they will say, they will tell you, don't li- they themselves don't take everything that they say. My point is, as I told you, brothers, many times before, don't get bullied into positions and know your religion. You have to, we have to, to the best of our ability, learn this religion. Now, I know much of what I'm saying right now may be over the heads of some of you, but there are some people who can appreciate what I'm telling you. Don't be of the people. Don't be of the people who, from every chitting chatter, it makes you get, un, you know, mutarab. You don't, don't be like that. Be like Al Imam Al Bukhari. Worship Allah and you know what you're doing. They are those people, they worship Allah, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know what they're doing at all. Learn your religion to the best of your ability. Don't be a person who's a blind follower if you can help that. From the ulama of Al Imam al Bukhari, and there are many, but from the, his students, are many as well. One of his students is. And Imam al Tirmidhi, Abu Isa Tirmidhi. And we have a brother right here, Abu Isa. I call him Abu Isa Tirmidhi. I think you guys should call this guy right here Abu Isa al Tirmidhi. He's from the students of Al Imam al Bukhari. Not him, not him. <laughs> but from his ulama and their meaning, his scholar who really took care of Al Imam al Bukhari's spirituality, not Sufism. His zuhd, his wara, which is from our religion. And a person who doesn't have this, he's not a real true salafi. A zuhd and wara, being a spiritual person, being able to cry in Ramadan and outside of Ramadan, being able to say to your kid when you make a mistake, hey, I shouldn't have dealt with you in that type of way. Being able to be humble, relax yourself, not being arrogant, not seeing yourself as, well, we were patient on you enough to humble and now we have to say something. Hey, what are you talking about? Who made you the one who has to say something? Who are you? Relax. Take it easy. There was a scholar, his name is Al-Imam Sa'id Al-Darimi. Sa'id ibn Mansur Al-Darimi. Al-Imam Al-Darimi was one of the tremendous ulama of the Sunnah. He has a book of Hadith as well. And in the beginning of his Hadith, he brings a number of Transmissions from the companions from the Nabi Sallallahu talking about the importance of the Sunnah. Tremendous narrations. The narration of Abdullah bin Mas'ud, one of the greatest narrations of the companions. Tremendous <laughs> Tremendous statements. He was one of the people who used to pay attention to Al Imam Al Bukhari's spirituality. From those scholars that he knew, and they were many, Akhwani, many. From them is the tremendous Imam Ali Al Madini. Ali Al Madini, many, many. We're not here to tell you all the ulama of Al Imam Bukhari. But from them was a scholar, his name was Ishaq ibn Rahuya. Abu Ibrahim Ishaq Rahuya. This man, he had his own madhab, but his madhab, it disappeared and it died for different reasons, some of which were political and other than that. And his madhab was stronger, if not better, than the four madhab that we have right now. His madhab was better than Al-Imam Ahmed, Al-Imam Al-Shafi, Abu Hanifa, Al-Imam Malik. He was a teacher of Al-Imam Al-Bukhari. He sat Al-Imam Ishaq ibn Ibrahim Rahuya. He was sitting with his students. He said, I would advise that one of you 
students, you should make it your business to put together a book in which you bring together only the authentic hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and make it strong. And he left them with that advice. Al-Imam Bukhari was sitting in the audience and that word and that advice, it reached his spirit, the essence of his ruh. So he decided to do that. He said, I had a dream. And Imam Bukhari said, I had a dream. And in my dream, I saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he was sitting and he described the way the Nabi looked Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it was in accordance to the Sunnah. What we heard the Prophet say about himself and what we heard what his companion said. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He said that there were flies flying around the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then Imam al-Bukhari said, I had with me in my hand a fan and I was shooing the flies away, not allowing the flies to touch the sunnah, not allowing the flies that land on the nasty things to get close to the sunnah mutahara. He said, the next day, I went to the sheikh, the one who told him, why don't you people bring this book together? He said to the sheikh, I saw this in my dream and that in my dream. Look at al-Imam al-Bukhari. There is a minhaj in the dreams that you have. The Prophet ﷺ taught us many things about the dream. Many things. And from the minhaj of Al-Islam about the dream, show me where this is in Sikhism, Hinduism. Tell me where some of these people had this. Christianity, Judaism. Many things to do when you see a dream. Many things. And from those things is... If you see a bad dream, don't talk about it to anybody. If you see a, dream, a good dream, then only tell it to someone you love. Tell it to the people of knowledge so that they can interpret it for you, inshallah. He went to a sheikh and said, I saw in the dream the Nabi was there, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I had the fan and I was shooing the flies away. What do you think it is? He said, I think you are going to be the one to put this book together. So Imam al-Bukhari has decided to do it. He decided to do it. And Imam al-Bukhari's book, Sal al-Bukhari, as I mentioned, has over 53 explanations. The two best explanations, number one, the explanation by Imam Ibn Rajab al-Hanbali. It's called Fath al-Bari. He was a student of Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah. Ibn Rajab was a student of Ibn Taymiyyah. But he died before he finished that book. He died. The second one, the best one, is the one that's well known today. By Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani. Your kid has to know. Because after Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, his mother, once his mother gave birth to him, no woman gave birth to a person like that after. Did you hear what I said to you right now, Ahlul Islam? After Imam Ibn Hajar al-Asqalani's mother gave birth to him, no woman gave birth to a man after him like that. No lady. No lady. And that's without any ghulu. But is he perfect? Of course not. No one is perfect. The only perfect one is Allah Azza wa Jal. And the only perfect one in terms of being a human being is the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Anyway. And Imam Ibn Hajjah said that inside the Bukhari there are over 7,252 hadith. 7,252 without being repeated. And Imam al-Bukhari, they said, memorized over 1 million hadith, over 1 million in his head. Authentic and not authentic. But in his book, he put 7,252. He said about himself, listen to this. He said, every time I wanted to put a hadith in this book, I would make a ghusl, and then I will pray two rakat, and then I will put the hadith. After weighing it and judging it, should I, should I not? Why should I? Why shouldn't I? That's minhaj. That's a tathabut. Not like the people today. I heard he said this, and I heard he said that, and I heard this, and I heard that. And you just heard. You don't know anything. You just heard. The sheikh said, that sheikh said, he said, you don't even know. And Imam al-Bukhari, he will look at the hadith, he will judge it, he will compare it, he, before he puts it in, 
He knows he wants to put it in. He will put it in after, after. Making a ghusl. 7,252 times. Al-Imam Bukhari, akhwani, he is a rams. He is a symbol of minhaj. He's a symbol of a tathabut being established, knowing what you're doing. He wasn't one of those haphazard people making decisions and just saying what you feel like saying. I remember a few years ago, there was some talk that was given from the Ajhal and Nas called the history of Salafia in the UK. No minhaj, the minhaj of the mu'arrakhin in our religion. We have a minhaj in everything. A minhaj in ibadah. A minhaj in aqidah. I'm talking to you, I'm talking to you. A methodology, a methodology. How do you read the Quran? How do you learn? You want to get knowledge? You can't get knowledge by opening this book today and then you close it, opening that book tomorrow, you close it. No, you have to have a methodology. All your knowledge is going to be like Swiss cheese. You're going to have holes all over the place. You have to know what you're doing. The history of Salafia in the UK by a jahil who knows nothing about history and the way of going about things in history. Nah, ma, not like that, Ahi. Our religion is not like that. Hey, hey guys, relax before I give you the minhaj of, of hey, all right? So as we were mentioning, Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala concerning that book, Sahih al-Bukhari, Sahih al-Bukhari. few things we want to mention, we have to wrap this up. From the shubahat that we have to deal with right now is our scholar who we thank Allah for giving us the opportunity for being exposed to a salafiyah by him, Allah. And when the doors of a salafiyah opened up, they were in the direction of a Sheikh Nasr al-Din al-Albani and his balanced. One of the tremendous scholars of al-Hadith during our time. He came and he serviced al-Imam al-Bukhari's book. And he has a book in which he pulled out some of the hadith of Sahih al-Imam Bukhari. And some people went overboard and they said, Al-Bani is the first one and he criticized Sahih al-Bukhari and he was the first one to come and categorize the hadith in Al-Imam Bukhari's book. And as a result of this, not having knowledge and being mutasibin, this is something that we want to touch upon, that this is not true. Before Al-Albani, who never really criticized Al-Albani's books or Al-Bukhari's books, there's a tremendous scholar in Al-Islam. His name is Al-Imam Al-Darqutini. Al-Imam Al-Darqutini, he came and he wrote a book called Al-Tatabu' Al-Ilzam, Al-Tatabu' Al-Tatabu' Wal-Ilzamat, in which he criticized Al-Imam Al-Bukhari and Al-Imam Muslim. And he said, they should have put this hadith and they should have put that hadith and they should not have put this hadith and that hadith. So he criticized them. And the reason why he did that is because in knowledge, there's no thing in knowledge in our religion, they call it jamud. Jamud, like this right here. This is jamid. It doesn't move. It doesn't move. Today, I'm of the opinion that I shouldn't move my finger in the salat. I'm of the opinion that I should keep it straight. Someone comes to me tomorrow and they explain this issue to me and they say, look at this. And then I change my position because Islam is not like that. Knowledge in our religion. Today, I'm of the opinion that I shouldn't read Surah Al-Fatiha behind the Imam. If he's reading out loud, I should listen to what he has to say. But if he's reading Salat al-Dhuhr, Salat al-Asr, if he's reading Maghrib and Isha silently, then I should recite that. Someone comes to me and they show me some of these proofs. I change my mind. Today I'm of the opinion, I'm of the opinion that if a person abandons the Salat and he's lazy in a doing it, he abandons Salat, but he's lazy, he still believes it's wajib. I believe that he's still a Muslim. Someone comes and he shows me the proof. The soul, no, 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 no. He's out of Islam. I have to change my position. 
Today I'm of the opinion that as long as a Muslim doesn't make shirk billah, he doesn't make shirk, he does everything else under the sun, but he doesn't make shirk. I'm of the opinion go outside of Al Islam. Someone comes and they show me, hey, listen, what about this, this, that, that? I have to change my position. You can't be like that. You can't be like that. Jamud, some of our elders, some of our elders. This is just an example. I'm from Bangladesh. My daughter comes and says, this guy wants to marry from Pakistan. I say, no way, Jose, it would never happen no matter what. And I won't move on that. That's not our religion. The Muslim has to be ready to be flexible, to listen, to see what's being said, to entertain what's coming to him. Jamud. There's none of that in our religion. Except for a few issues. There are things that don't change in El Islam. They don't change. The five pillars of Islam. The six arkan of El Iman. Allah is one. Will never be two. One and a half. The Prophet wasallam is the only one you have to listen to. And obey unconditionally. There are things that don't change. But other things are not constant. You have to be willing to have maruna, to be flexible, to be able to move. And knowledge helps you to know what you can be flexible in and what you can't be flexible in. So, and Imam al-Albani wasn't the first one to do that. Ibn Hajar, rahimullah, the second one who has the best explanation of Sayyid al-Bukhari, Ibn Hajar, Ibn Ibn Rajab, both of them, in the explanation of the ahadith of Al-Imam Bukhari, they criticize some of the ahadith in that book. Al-Imam Al-Hakim. So, relax on that. Some of the people, and the last thing that we want to mention, and I think this is really important as well, is that Al-Imam Al-Bukhari, towards the end of his life, he had a big fitna. Some of the people of the sunnah, they said that Al-Imam Al-Bukhari was a Mubtadi. Now I need you guys to listen to this. And I'm going to finish this in five minutes. Inshallah, Zakaria. Some of the ulama of Ahl Sunnah from Ahl Al-Hadith. Ulama. They said that Al-Imam Al-Bukhari was a Mubtadi. And the reason why they said that was jealousy. Al-Imam Al-Bukhari came to a country, a city called Nisabur. That's where Al Imam Muslim was from. The leading scholar there was a man by the name of Muhammad ibn Yahya al Zuhali. Radiallahu anhu wa rahimahullah. He's from the ulama of al Islam. Thiqatun thet, a scholar of hadith. But when Al Imam al Bukhari came to the city, there was jealousy. There was jealousy. That sheikh was jealous of what Allah gave to Imam al-Bukhari. And I don't say this from the bab of ghiba against that sheikh. I say this from what our ulama have written about the reality of the situation. There was jealousy. When Imam al-Bukhari came to his city, his sitting where he was giving classes, it shrunk. And the people went to sit with Al Imam Al Bukhari. This great scholar of the Sunnah, this great scholar of Al Islam, of the Sunnah, he said, Al Imam Al Bukhari believes that the Quran is created. And that's one of the biggest fitnas that ever hit the Muslims during that time. And Al Imam Al Bukhari didn't believe that. But something was created. He didn't even say that. He said some words that were taken out of context and this is what was attached to him. And as a result of that, a big fitna ensued. A big fitna. Some of the major scholars of Islam avoided Al-Imam Bukhari because of the fitna. Like Al-Imam Ibn Abi Hatim. Like Al-Imam Abu Zur'a. Abu Hatim and Abu Zur'a. They avoided Al-Imam Bukhari because they didn't want that fitna. They didn't have to deal with that fitna. They never narrated from an Imam Bukhari. An Imam Muslim never narrated from an Imam Bukhari. Fitna. And I do advise brothers with that. 
One brother was telling me he was going to SP during Ramadan. I used to tell that brother, when you go there, just keep your mouth shut. Don't defend anybody. Just go and do your ibadah because if you put yourself in that position, you're going to have a fitna. Some of our young students, they go to Medina. When these brothers come with you, all that kalam, don't say anything. Just keep your hand under the radar and do what you're there for. Don't put yourself in the way of fitna. Don't put yourself in that situation. Big fitna. Big fitna with Al Imam Bukhari and this man. To say that Al Imam Bukhari was an innovator, subhanAllah, if Al Imam Al Bukhari was and is an invader, then I don't know anybody from the Sunnah. Al Imam Al Dhahabi, when he wrote about the biography of Al Imam Al Bukhari in his book, Sir Alam Al Nubala, he said that this statement against Bukhari was a big zulm, big oppression. Big oppression. Al Bukhari, he wrote, he wrote books against the people of a ta'asub. He wrote a book called Al Qira'a Khalf Al Imam. You know, some of the people, they don't believe you should do recitation behind the Imam. Raf al Yadain, the Hanafi people of Kufa, they were against this. And Al Imam Al Bukhari traveled all over. He traveled to Kufa, he traveled to Basra, he traveled to Al Baghdad, traveled to Egypt, he traveled everywhere to Eastern, Eastern Asia, you know, like Armenia and Azerbaijan, all those places. He traveled all over multiple times. So he knew what he was dealing with. But anyway, he wrote books to refute the people of a ta'asub. Al Imam al Bukhari, he was against the people of innovation, like the Murji'a. Al Imam Bukhari he understood Al Iman. Al Iman, it is your statement with your tongue, your actions and your limbs, and it is the belief in your heart. It goes up and it goes down. You can see that in his books, Al Bukhari. You won't find one Sheikh of Al Imam Al Bukhari, not one, who was accused of irja. Not one. Not one. Because that was his way of saying, hey, you have to be a mu'min, inshallah, a Muslim, and you have to work by what you're claiming. So, practically speaking, as they say in America, the proof is in the pudding. And Imam al-Bukhari showed the people, hey, this is what I believe. All you have to do is look at my book. You have to look at the different books that I wrote. And they were many. He has a book that is called Kitab Khalq Af'al al-Ibad. The book that the deeds of the servants are created it's a refutation against the people of Al-Qadariya. Al-Qadariya. And Imam Al-Bukhari practically proved all of this stuff. But anyway, the reason why I bring that to the table, Ikhwani, is we're living in a time right now where one sheikh of the Salafi people may talk about another sheikh from the Salafi people. One Salafi brother may talk about another brother who's Salafi. One masjid of Salafi people may talk about another masjid of people who's Salafi. Don't listen to this stuff. Don't preoccupy yourselves with this stuff. Turn yourselves to beneficial knowledge and leave these gogha. Leave these people who just wasting time with trying to remain relevant with this kalam. This happened with our ulama before. If today, one sheikh, I'm attempted to say his name. I want to say his name, but I don't think it's necessary and it may be fitna. I want to say the sheikh's name. I say that this sheikh, he has hawa. And what he's saying against other people is from hawa. And people jump up and down and get upset. I say, relax. This happened with scholars who were greater than him in the past. Scholars who were greater than him in the past, they had that jealousy and they had hawa. And it was the motivation. So those people get caught in the middle, try to do your best with not being of the people who Yom al your deeds are going to be taken from you. From the statements of Al Imam al Bukhari was, he said, Al Bukhari, once I realized and I came to know that backbiting was impermissible, I never backbit anyone else. And that was his job. That was his job. As a muhaddith and a scholar, it was his job to say, so and so is da'if, so and so is this, so and so is that. So whenever you find Al Imam al Bukhari saying something about someone, you better pay attention to it. He has a number of books other than Sahih Bukhari. From those books, he has his book Al Adab Al Mufrad, also that Al Bani took care of. 
has a book where he grades the men in narrations. One is called a Tariq al Kabir, a Tariq al Sagir, a Tariq al Wasat. All of those books are kutub that are mu'tamada. You have to depend and you have to rely on those books. I will mention some other ones from what Al Imam al Bukhari has put forward. Khwani, in concluding and in finishing, Al Imam al Bukhari. It's easy for us to come and just say, MashaAllah, nice story, nice this, nice that. But I think the one thing we should hold on to and we should walk away with, the life and the legacy. From the life and legacy of Imam Bukhari, he is a raju, a man of the Minhaj al-Sarifi. A person of a tathabbut who worshiped Allah and he knows what he's doing. He knows what he's doing. He said, I did, Imam Bukhari said, I did not start to write hadith until I had the ability to distinguish what the Prophet said and what the Prophet didn't say. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. Person comes today and he says, Ah, the Prophet he says, Sallallahu alayhi wasallam, Inna abgad at talaq in Allah, Inna abgad al halal Allah talaq. The thing that Allah hates the most is talaq. The Prophet says, Sallallahu alayhi wasallam, if it wasn't for you, Ya Muhammad, I wouldn't have created the universe. And the person just goes on telling all of these fabricated and weak hadith. And Imam Bukhari said, I did not sit down to start writing a book of hadith until I had the ability to distinguish between what the Prophet really said and what the Prophet didn't say. So we're going to stop here, inshallah. We're going to prepare for salat. And before the salat, we just want to acknowledge the presence of, we talked about Imam al-Bukhari, Abdullah, Ibn al-Mubarak, we talked about Hamad, Ibn al-Zaid, we talked about Ibrahim Rahu, Ishaq ibn Ibrahim Rahuya, great scholars of Islam. We just want to mention Abu Hanifa. Abu Hanifa, our Abu Hanifa, he has come back, alhamdulillah, and we say to him, because we missed him during the days of, of Ramadan, taqabbar Allahu minna wa minkum, and it's good to have you back. هذا وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على النبينا وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته